Uh, good afternoon. It's not afternoon. It's not morning. It's noon. So good noon sounds like a very unusual uh, start of a conversation. Welcome, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Pharmacocracy Institute, as its proud director, I'm very happy to welcome Torsten Lumsch. Uh, we'll introduce our speaker in a couple of minutes, but I want to give the audience a little bit of a perspective of what we're doing today. This is a tradition, and uh, we are in a lucky position to have those traditions. Uh, there are several traditions. Uh, the Pharmacognosy Institute is the, the next generation version of what used to be called the UIC Botanical Center. Uh, the Pharmacognosy Institute is a, a broader oriented institute that encompasses not just botanical research, but uh, things related to dietary supplements, including analytical work, ethnobotanical work, it's a, it's a broader scope. And it, at this point, it involves 23 research faculty and tenured faculty. And we build on the tradition, not only of the Botanical Center, but at a, on a long tradition of pharmacognosy at UIC. Those of you who pay attention to walls and, and displays may have seen that in 1959, in this very room, the American Society of Pharmacognosy was formed. And the person that was one of the first presidents and the founding father was Norman Fonsworth. And so you, you will see his name there because eventually this room had been, has been dedicated to, to be under his name. So we're in the Norman R. Fonsworth Lecture Hall. Uh, this is a lot of history, as you can imagine. And this also shows you the reason why we have the Atkins Medicinal Plant Garden, which we're very proud of. Uh, this is the first, actually the second event that we do hybrid, right? So after the unspeakable experience with a virus, we've had trouble to accommodate a garden walk and we did a virtual walk initially, and that was quite successful. And now we're moving to virtual formats, but we really want the in-person formats, which I think most, if not all of you would agree with that. At the same time, we got a little bit more electronic with uh, 2D barcode signs and there's postings on the web. So you're welcome to look for PHCI, the Pharmacognosy Institute's online to, to get an information about the garden. Uh, on behalf of the College of Pharmacy, our institute runs the garden walk and other events related to plants. We have a pretty detailed webpage, so if anybody's interested in the various activities, please feel free to do this. And the other part of the tradition that's coming along with the garden walk started by my colleague, Dol Soyarto, who should really be given credit for getting this whole Atkins garden scenario started and established. Uh, I think you started 2007 with a garden walk, Dol. Uh, something like this. So this is, you know, 15 years roughly. Um, this is a, so we're trying to continue with your participation, obviously, this tradition. And we also try to continue the tradition of having a Atkins Garden Walk speaker. And this is Torsten Lumsch from the Field Museum today. Thank you, Torsten, for coming. And I think the, it's a good point to turn over. There's one thing I should not forget. There's another person that is intimately involved with the, the formation, the establishment of the garden, other than the donors, the Atkins family. Uh, Bernie Gresky, those of you involved with UIC a little longer, uh, they will remember Bernie as the, the heart and soul of managing the College of Pharmacy grounds and building. Uh, without her, Essentially, nothing would have gotten done around here. She was phenomenal, and she was a very nice colleague, too. Unfortunately, we have to speak of her in the past. As of a week ago or so, we got the notice from her daughter. Uh, they're going to celebrate her life, and that is really the, the tone of Bernie. Uh, there's, yeah, the grievance is, is an important part, of the, but it's really about celebrating her positive spin on life. And we see a lot of that positivity in the fact that we actually do have a well, well-established and well-functioning Atkins Garden. So I want to 
commemorate her with a few words. And those of you who are interested, uh, there you can get information through our department if you want to go to the celebratory event on Sunday. So with that being said, uh, our student speaker is handicapped with another virus or something, <laughs> or just a sore throat. So I'm gonna turn it right away to Bethany to introduce our speaker. Great, thank you, Guido. Um, so I, I just would like to say a few words about the history and the purpose of the Atkins Garden. Um, so it's for some history, it was dedicated in July 2002 in memory of Dorothy Bradley Atkins. And this was by her husband, Robert Atkins. So they met while they were both students here at UIC. Um, they were both graduates of 1945. So Dorothy was here in the College of Pharmacy and Robert was over in the College of Medicine. Um, and he went on to become a renowned surgeon. Um, Dorothy always had a deep interest in medicinal plants. And when she passed away in 1995, Robert wanted to do something to commemorate her. So he donated funds to College of Pharmacy to create the Atkins Garden in her memory and honor. So the Atkins Garden is now a very unique resource for UIC and for the College of Pharmacy. Um, we hold a living example of a lot of things that have gone on to become pharmaceuticals and medications, um, botanicals and dietary supplements that we can find all over. And there aren't many other pharmacy schools that have such a resource and especially one that's serving both researchers and the greater public. So the Atkins Garden here itself has three main goals. One of those is to provide support and resources for research in the College of Pharmacy. One is to provide resources for teaching. And then one goal is for public outreach. So the Garden Walk event that we're having today is really for this goal of public outreach. Um, so it's, it's important because we have like this unique platform where we can bring researchers and the greater community together and have this dialogue that's uh, frequently lacking, I think, with a lot of science. And um, in today's day and age with uh, mistrust in science that we're seeing, I think this is a very important platform to have. So as Guido mentioned, first event was in 2007. We've had it every year since, um, including virtually. And we just want to acknowledge Dr. Do Soyarto for this because he really was the creator of this Garden Walk event along with the garden itself. Um, and he's, he's turned it into this fun festive event that we've been able to have every year. Um, so we should mention over the years, we've had a number of very generous donors that have contributed funding. So Dr. Robert A. Atkins, who donated the funds to get it started. Um, Guido just talked about Bernie Gresky. So Sharice Gresky lost her husband um, some years ago. So she's also donated quite a bit to getting speakers for the Garden Walk every year and a number of other things for the garden. So her husband was Al Lesnovich and her mother was Bernie Gresky. And we have benches for both of them out there in the garden. So you may have noticed their names before. We should also mention last year, um, Dr. Allison Doubleday generously donated some funds in honor and memory of Dr. Janet Riddle, who's in the College of Medicine. And we've started the Health Professions Education Fund for, with that. So previous speakers for the Garden Walk have been a, a very wide variety of professions. So we've had ethnobotanists, nutritionists, analytical chemists, integrative cancer treatment therapists, and many things in between. And today we are very pleased and honored to add Dr. Torsten Lumpsch to this. Um, so let me just say a few words to introduce Torsten. So Torsten is Vice President of Science and Education at the Field Museum of Natural History. Um, he's also a curator and specializes in lichenized fungi. He's served as Vice President since 2017. Um, and he oversees the Field Museum's four centers which are collections, integrative research, science action, and learning. So Torsten has been fascinated by lichen since childhood. He actually published his first scientific paper at the age of 15. 
He received his PhD from University of Essen in Germany in 1993. Um, he's been an assistant professor in Germany before he came to the Field Museum. He's got a very prolific number of publications, so more than 500 at this point, more than 20 book chapters, five books. He has active research collaborations in Thailand, Spain, and Kenya, and he's an investigator on research grants in the US, Brazil, and Spain. Um, he's done field work in more than a dozen countries all over the world, and he's collaborated on description of more than 280 new lichen species. He's editor of the journal Michael Keys. He's on more than a dozen other editorial boards, and he's also an active uh, mentor to scientists of tomorrow. So he lectures both here at UIC um, as well as University of Chicago and is active in advising grad students. Um, and he's also active with working with kindergarten through 12th grade educational programs. And he co-created um, the exhibit about lichens at the Field Museum. I don't know if anybody saw that. It was a pretty great museum where they had actually, uh, they got a truck door, car door, that had lichens growing all over it and they brought that and put it on display. Um, okay, so without further ado, I will invite Dr. Lumps to the stand to deliver his lecture. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Bethany, for this uh, kind introduction. Before I start, I wanted as a, a special for those who are here in person, I wanted to give you a uh, uh, a guide to common lichens of the Chicago land. There are actually a few lichens on the rocks, at least. The trees, I think, are too young to have lichens, but you will find those lichens everywhere in Chicago. Uh, take one of those um, if you want. Um, that is, um, is a product, product of our uh, COVID frustration when we were basically uh, stuck to be the whole time in Chicago. So my colleague Todd uh, Wittelm, who is collection manager at the Field Museum and I decided, let's just uh, take photos of common lichens here and, and produce a small guide for people to, to uh, be able to identify these, these lichens. Okay. Um, I want to start with um, explaining um, what lichens actually are. Lichens uh, do not look like the uh, different parts uh, of which they consist of. They rather look like a moss or a, a liverwort. However, they are not related at all. Bryophytes are plants, but lichens are actually fungi that uh, associate with algae. So they are fungi that, um, that pretend to be plants. So they are two, two different organisms living together. One of the partner is algae. Um, and there's actually one species of red algae. I just put it in because red algae are beautiful. Uh, and one species of brown algae uh, present in lichen symbiosis, but the large majority of lichens is actually, how can I use this thing? Um, do I, is this working? Well, okay, let's just forget about it. The majority of it um, is, I can actually use the, the yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that, Okay, this one. Well, so everyone can see that I'm not very technology savvy, but uh, most of the algae in the lichens, we will talk about more details in a bit, look more like these small uh, balls or so unicellular small uh, algae. Uh, and then, of course, the question is, what are algae? And you may think that this is a trivial question, but in fact, algae are a paraphyletic, in fact, actually polyphyletic group uh, of totally unrelated organisms. So red algae are very distinct from brown algae. So seaweeds, brown algae are closer to, closer related to some 
uh, pathogenic uh, fungus-like organisms um, than to other algae. However, the green algae, they are what we call a paraphyletic group. So they are a basal group to the land plants. So the land plants originated from, from these algae. So it's really difficult to uh, define what algae are. Let's just say they are kind of photosynthetic uh, organisms that are not land plants. The second partner uh, are fungi and fungi um, are actually a monophyletic group. So they are all real fungi are related to each other and fungi are the sister group to animals. So they are further away evolutionary from plants uh, or as distant from plants as we are. So uh, fun, we are closer related to fungi than the fungi are to the plants. Um, so, uh, well, that's what I already said. So they are monophyletic group, closer related here to, to animals than, than to the plants that are here um, in a distant relationship. Fungi are different from algae or plants. They don't have chlorophyll. So they have to find other strategies uh, to, um, to survive. And there are three main strategies, you could say. One is to live on dead material. In fall, you can see uh, fungi growing on, on leaf litter uh, or a very common also on horse dung, you have some fungi. They feed on, on dead material or saprobionts, you could call it. Another strategy is to live on living things and be a parasite. So the ergot fungus is an example, which of course is of course medicinal pharmacological interest, uh, the uh, ergot fungus, or also of uh, pharmacological interest are uh, the um, Cordycipitaceae, so the fungi that grow on arthropods. So you have parasites, that's another way of um, surviving for fungi, or you can restrain yourself, not kill your uh, partner, but live with the partner. So that's a mutual symbiosis and very uh, famous of course is mycorrhizal uh, relationships. And um, I always tell my students, there would be no land plants without fungi because even the first fossils of land plants showed mycorrhizal relationships. So um, they probably made it happen that plants uh, conquered land uh, roughly 400, 500, 450 million years ago. So a lichen uh, has a fungus and an algae and often more partners, and we won't go into much detail there, but a classical lichen has a, a stratified structure, morphological structure, where the algal partner is usually constrained to what we call an algal layer, is covered by a cortical layer, and then you have a medulla and a lower cortex. Not all those species of lichens have the same kind of structure. There are more simpler ways to structure specific uh, uh, structures that are formed. But in general, you could say that the majority of the lichen thallus is actually formed by fungal hyphae. Um, and the algal layer, the algae, the photobiont in general, is usually surrounded by fungal hyphae that make sure that the, the sugar or sugar alcohols in, uh, in cyanobacteria, it's sugar in green algae and brown algae, it's different type of sugar alcohols, is transported uh, from the uh, algal partner to the fungal partner. And in fact, um, you may wonder whether this is really a mutualistic relationship because the vast majority of energy that is fixed through photosynthesis by the algal partner or cyanobacterial partner is transported to the fungal partner. And when you isolate the algal partner in a culture, 
in the first couple of days, they actually give a lot of the carbohydrates that they fix to the, to the agar medium or whatever medium you cultivate them in. But then they stop uh, after a while when they realize they are not in the lichen symbiosis anymore. So, um, so they are actually in a relatively poor nutritional state, uh, those algal partners. And if they don't perform well enough, the fungal partner often kills them and, uh, and, um, and digests them. And you can often see dead or remnants of dead algae within the lichen thalps. So the uh, lichens usually look totally different from their individual partners. So when you isolate the fungus, uh, it looks like a mold, but an extremely slow growing mold, I have to say. Um, so we now, uh, in our attempts to do uh, genomic sequencing of these microbions, we, you really have to be patient until you get enough material in your cultures to actually extract enough DNA for, for genome sequencing out of these cultures. So they are very slow usually, and then the algal partner also looks very different. So the lichen morphology that we will discuss a little bit uh, in a bit is only formed in the symbiotic stage. And it makes sense, why should a lichen, uh, lichenized fungus form an elaborate structure. The elaborate structure is there for the photobion to be able to do effective photosynthesis. In the absence of the photobion, there's no point in producing um, such a thallus. But because these lichens uh, basically act like plants, so they, the fungus gets the nutrients from the photobion, they can live on all kinds of substrate. So here, this uh, acarospora, for example, uh, in Spain grows on rock. Here is uh, Lecanora, also in Spain, uh, lives on, a, on tree bark. Uh, but you can even find lichens on old cars or fence posts or whatever. Uh, they just they just need a substrate. And as Bethany mentioned, when we were in Puerto Rico, before we started with the lichen exhibit at the Field Museum, I saw this old car in the rainforest and I thought, then we walked there and I saw that we can remove the door. So I said, we have to have this for the lichen exhibit. But I also found lichens growing on old shoes on newspapers uh, at the beach. So, they can just grow on whatever um, is available. They just need a substrate. And a colleague of mine, Robert Lücking, he did some experiments in Costa Rica about lichens that grow on leaves in the tropics. You have a number of those. And he just had like plastic uh, leaves. They look like leaves or so plastic. And he used them to study how succession happens on, uh, on these lichen leaves. And they are fine with it. They, they just uh, need a substrate. So it works very well for them. They form a lot of different structures uh, and a lot of different um, secondary metabolites, including nice pigments here. This letaria that occurs in California produces pulvinic acid derivatives. This one has antraquinones. Um, others have other colorless substances, and they have these forms. This is uh, Osnias that are very common in, in uh, montane forests. So this one is from uh, Mount Kenya, for example. Uh, here a few more. This is even, even more uh, uh, impressive. This is actually Ramalina. That's not an Osnia. That's from um, Calif Western California, where you can basically collect. Um, when I saw this the first time, I got so uh, crazy with collecting this. I could have filled a pillow with it uh, within two minutes or so. So um, they have a lot of morphologies, but the most beautiful one, in my opinion, is this uh, 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 Lichen. This is Claudia ferdinandii, which occurs on soil uh, in 
the south of Western Australia, south of Perth. So I find this the coral lichen um, extremely uh, beautiful. So we have different morphologies and they are specific for specific species or genera. So we have some that are like crusts, crustose lichens, then leafy ones, folios lichens, some squamules, we have these fruticos, dimorphic or pendulous, as you could see on these photos. And usually the morphology is specific for a species. So there are very rare cases where the morphology is different and it's still the same fungal species, then usually different photobionts are associated with those lichens and then they can look different. But in general, the morphology is stable for a specific uh, species. Lichens look extremely different from their partners and therefore for the longest time they were considered to be uh, a group next to bryophytes. Uh, and it was not until uh, the 18, 1860s that first de Bari and then Simon Schwendner uh, uh, basically uh, claimed that these lichens are not individual organisms, but they are um, composed of two different um, partners. And this is an illustration from Simon Schwendner's publication, which was actually a Habilitationsschrift in, in the German, he was actually Swiss, but in the German speaking countries, there's a tradition that you first do your PhD and then five to 10 years later, you publish a second thesis, which is the Habilitation. And that is then allows you to be um, to apply for a professorship. Uh, and this Habilitationsschrift uh, was uh, on the nature of the lichen symbiosis that Schwendner published at the time. Um, and interestingly, the leading lichen taxonomist at the time, they made fun of it. There's, it's nice to, or interesting to read the articles that they published at the time, basically uh, ridiculing the uh, hypothesis. And it was not until later uh, Stahl actually was able to resynthesize, separate the partners and resynthesize that um, lichenologists became convinced, yeah, well, he might have been right uh, when he published this. So um, there is a lot of discussion on the nature of the lichen symbiosis. Is it mutualistic? Is it controlled parasitism? Um, and uh, Trevor Goward a couple of years suggested instead, well, why don't we say that lichens are fungi um, that uh, discovered agriculture? Uh, so I like this, this approach um, to, the, to the idea. But uh, you can easily separate those uh, partners. Um, and some of those partners, even in the, mic the microbiont uh, culture, produce secondary metabolites. So Xanthoria parietina, this lichen here, when you isolate the fungal partner, it's very easy. I've done this as a schoolboy, actually. Uh, and the, the microbiont culture produces these antrachinones, even when it's not in the symbiotic uh, relationship. Other secondary metabolites are only expressed in the, um, in the uh, lichen symbiosis. So it really depends on different substances and, and uh, species. There are a number of different algae and cyanobacteria involved, and we don't want to go into details. I just want to show you the diversity of species here on the upper part, a few, and here a few. Uh, cyanobacteria nostoc actually is the most common one. It's also a very common cyanobacterium. And you often can see in uh, limestone areas, free living nostoc, and then some lichens that have nostoc in as symbiotic partners. The most common green algae in the lichen symbiosis is actually Trebuxia. And Trebuxia is relatively rare in nature or was 
considered to be rare in nature, has been found now recently more often, but is definitely not an extremely common green algae outside of the lichen symbiosis. But I would say that about 50% of all lichens have Trebuxia as a symbiotic partner. So in the lichen symbiosis, it's very common. Trentopulia is very common in tropical lichens. Uh, and there's like a gradient, the more you go towards the pole, the rarer Trentopulia is as a uh, partner. And even in these Antarctic and subantarctic regions, there's only one species of lichens that has Trentopulia in tropical areas. So uh, Bethany mentioned that I also work a lot in Thailand. I would say almost half of the lichens in, in Thailand have Trentopulia as symbiotic partners. So there's clearly uh, a pattern uh, based on, on the ecology, but then also on the phylogeny, because some clades have the entire family only has uh, Trebuxia, or only has Trentopulia as symbiotic partner. That leads us to the question of photobiont specificity. And here we have uh, basically everything is possible, you could say. We have here an example from uh, Scott Crokin's PhD now over 20 years ago. He was one of the first uh, using molecular markers to look at this. In this uh, yellow lichen that, that I showed you from California, the genus Letaria, where you have on one side the um, the algal partner here on the right hand side and the left hand side uh, you have the um, actually the the other way around left hand side I should know what left and right is but on the left hand side you see the uh, trebuxia the algal partner right hand side the fungal partners and you see there is some specificity so it's not randomly distributed so it's not like a textbook tanglegram of a parasite and a host, but it's not randomly distributed. Um, and then you have cases where you have clades of cyanobacteria here, the genus Rhizonema, that is only known from lichen uh, symbiosis, but it's included in distantly related groups of lichens. So in other words, in the tropics, there is a common cyanobacterial group that only is known from lichen symbiosis, but in very distantly related groups. How do they get those? Well, there are two tricks. One is vegetative asexual reproduction, like an instant lichen. You have some kind of uh, way of distributing both partners at the same time. The other is you just steal it from another species. And that's very common, juvenile parasitism for those species that, that um, disperse via spores. They germinate, they find uh, a host, they kill the host, the fungal partner, and take over the algal or cyanobacterial symbiont in this case. And then you have some studies of this is from, from reindeer lichens and that uh, are on sandy soil in Florida. And here, Rebecca Ya in her PhD looked at uh, different populations of different species. And here you see again, some species of lichens have always one type of Trebuxia here, either the dark one or the whitish one, while others can actually switch between different species, but even those have mostly one species, but then can associate with another species of Trebuxia as well. So here we again see quite a lot of specificity. And in another case where we looked in, at an ice-free area in, in uh, Maritime Antarctica, uh, on cyanobacteria, there we see exactly the opposite. So we were in, in Bias Peninsula, which is the largest ice-free area in maritime Antarctica. At the coast, Antarctica is full of lichens, lichens and bryophytes and huge pieces. But there are a lot of nutrients because there are a lot of animals, penguins, beautiful to see. But if you walk through a penguin colony, 
the only thing you can think of, don't fall because it stinks like hell. So, um, but these are nice nutrients for the lichens to grow. But when you go inland, it just takes 10 minutes to walk and there's basically everything is bare. But when you crawl on your knees, then you see there are tiny lichens and free living cyanobacteria. And these lichens all share, have something in common. They have either cyanobacteria as their primary uh, photobiont or as an additional. This one here, Placopsis, has green parts with a green algal partner. And then these structures called cephalodia, they house the cyanobacteria for the, um, for the nitrogen fixation. And um, I just collected like crazy and Nora Wirtz, who did PhD at the time, she just sequenced those. And what we found is totally unrelated. They belong to different orders or subclasses unrelated lichenized fungi all share exactly the same cyanobacterial partner. So here you have reduced uh, uh, selectivity. So they basically, there's nothing else around. So if they want to survive, they have to be a little less choosy and just take whatever is there. So that, us, that led to the question of what explains the occurrence of photobionts. Is it phylogeny, is it ecology? And there we looked at a large data set that we had from North America. Um, and the, the result was that it's actually a combination. It's phylogeny and we simplified. We said it's the same genus and, and the, the species of Trabuxia just to simplify. And I know nobody knows what a genus is. It's fantasy, I know, but it's just a proxy for phylogenetic relatedness. Uh, and it better explains the presence of uh, Trebuxia species than the phylogeny itself or the ecology itself. Um, and we found the similar thing just yesterday. I met with one of my students and she sequenced Trebuxia from, uh, from Antarctic uh, lichens and from the same genus European species to compare temperate and, and polar regions. In the polar regions, all the different species shared the same Trebuxia, green algae, not cyanobacteria. So the same what, what Nora found was the cyanobacteria. And the European ones, you had a nice phylogenetic structure between, so the Trebuxia species A only uh, associated with this species complex and the other one B was the other one. So you had more of a phylogenetic structure. And this is just uh, an example where you see here different gene genera of lichens and what kind of uh, algae they associate with. <clears throat> you see, it is not total chaos, but that's not really a lot of structure either. Um, so in a way, there is some flexibility, and I couldn't help myself to put this quote from uh, my Swiss colleague, Rosemary Honegger. She basically said the lichen thallus is an elegant culture chamber for photobiome cells. And this is just to show you, uh, we, we use hammer and chisel to get the lichens off the rocks here. That's... Uh, 10 years or 15 years ago, I looked much younger at that time. Um, and then we put them in the herbarium. Of course, we make it a little bit nicer, but this is a, a, a collection from, from 1850 that I just like to, to look at. So when did lichen uh, evolve? Um, we know that lichens evolved several times in unrelated uh, clades of fungi, but when did it start? Well, there is very little fossil evidence. And one reason for the scarcity of fossil evidence is that um, like these fossils are difficult to interpret. Lichens are not very, don't have complex structures. So when you have a fossil, how do you decide whether it's a lichen, an algae, or a bryophyte? Very difficult. And um, you basically, you have to find some remnants of what could be photobiont cells in kind of a structure of, um, of a fungal tissue. 
And this is the oldest uh, known fossil, which is roughly 400 uh, million years old. The next oldest is 125 million years old. This, and these are then two 125 million years old. And then we only have, we only have about 150 fossils. Uh, and the other ones are 45 to 20 million years old in amber. So that's the fossil record, really very poor fossil record. So what we do is we use molecular markers and try to play with relaxed uh, molecular clocks to try to understand. And since those molecular approaches somewhat uh, are congruent with the fossil data, our data suggest that lichens, at least the clades of fungi that have lichens nowadays are not very old. They basically evolved in parallel with land plants. So the old idea when I started a uh, hundred years ago to get interest in lichens, the idea was that lichens are a very ancient group and neither fossil record nor molecular data support such an idea. They suggest that lichens evolved in parallel with land plants and are not very old. And uh, the same is true for the algal clades that are involved in, in the lichen symbiosis. I mentioned already Trebuxia. Some are related, others are not really related at all. When we look at the fungal part, we see again that uh, actually some of the clades that are very diverse, like the Parmeliaceae, are relatively recently evolved. Parmeliaceae currently is the largest family of lichenized fungi. About 20% of all lichens belong to this family, but the family is relatively young. It split from its sister group that is monotypic, so only has one species, interestingly. Um, roughly 120 million years ago. So relatively recent clade. And within the clade, you have a huge disparity in species numbers. So there are quite a number of uh, clades that are relatively small. And then you have a less than a handful of large genera, including Santa Palmieri, which is the largest genus, monophyletic genus that is also supported by the molecular data of all lichen forming fungi with roughly 800 species. And there you see, when you look at the phylogeny and the speciation rates over the phylogeny of this family, you see that Xanthopamelia and some other groups in Palmelia, you see, really had, had an increase in diversification, which is uh, color coded by red, the darker red, the higher the diversification rate is, really not that long ago, roughly 50 million years ago. And when we look at uh, what happened during the time, it was really uh, the increase, dramatic increase in diversification rate is associated with um, a change in, in the climate. It got cooler and more arid. And the genus Xanthopamelia grows on rocks and soil in open habitats not in the tropical rainforest. And the genus Usnea that is also, uh, also had this increase in diversification is on bark or rocks, but in always exposed habitats. So there is, ecologically, it makes sense that they had an increase in diversification. If we can find these increases and in changes in diversification rate, we would expect that lichens suffered during some of these extinction as well, especially in 66 million years ago, they must, fungi they are decomposers, they must have had a heyday and increase in diversification rates. Our lichenized fungi must have suffered because they pretend to be plants and have this relationship with algae if there was a really a long time of a nuclear winter of a year, they must have suffered. Well, as I said, we don't have a large of uh, fossil records, so we don't know what, what uh, got extinct, but 
we can look at molecular data and find out who survived and then exploded similarly as uh, birds did or mammals did after the uh, KT boundary. And surprising or not so surprisingly, we found that all those clades here in red that are now hyperdiverse, that have large number of species, especially Parmeliaceae, when you look at the diversification rate after this 66 million year uh, KT boundary, boundary, there was an explosion and an increase in diversification rate in these clades. So in a way, those lichens that are now the most dominant lichens uh, that we see, they had their main diversification also after the KT uh, boundary. So they really uh, show the same diversification pattern that we know from mammals, from plants, from birds, and also some frog families. So they behave like other organisms, you could say. Well, this is more detail of specific clades. We don't have to go into this. Rather, uh, go to another case, air pollution and climate change. Lichens are usually known to the general public because they are very sensitive to air pollution, especially sulfur dioxide. And when I was young and I grew up in Frankfurt, I had a hard time finding these lichens in Frankfurt because of air pollution. I only found very few. Uh, it was the center of Frankfurt was basically a lichen desert and you have to go into the mountains. Even there, you didn't find a lot of, of lichens. And this uh, illustrates that's a nice uh, illustration from the British Lichen Society, where here on the left hand side you have the city uh, with the chimneys, and here you have the nice landscape. And basically, here on the left, you have algae, a lichen desert, or a few lichens, Lecanora conicioides, which when I grew up was a most common lichen in cities in Central Europe. Now it's on the red list of lichens in, in Germany, and I'm happy that it is. Um, it's a very toxic tolerant lichen that could or still occur. And then here on the right hand side, you have beautiful lichens that need more uh, cleaner air. With the decrease in, in uh, uh, air pollution of sulfur dioxide, these lichens reinvaded uh, cities and and you can find, as, as you know, um, lichens even here in Chicago. Then the question was, can we use, when lichens are these great bioindicators for air pollution, can we use them as indicators for climate change? Uh, they are sensitive to, to climate. So some lichens only occur in the tropics, others only in polar regions. So there was this idea that lichens are perfect indicator of uh, climate change. And uh, when I saw some publications and at some meetings saw presentations on how great this is and how immense the uh, impact of climate change is already in Central Europe, I was skeptical because one species that was used as climate indicator is this Pamelina quercina. But I knew that Pamelina quercina, because I looked at the type in the Berlin herbarium, was described from Berlin, the Tiergarten in Berlin. That doesn't occur there anymore because Tiergarten is in the center of the city. But 1782, when the species was first discovered, uh, it grew in the city of Berlin. Berlin is in the east of Germany, pretty continental. So if it now occurs in Frankfurt, why is this an indicator of climate change? So what we did is we went through herbaria in Europe and got a lot of data from GBIF and basically modeled from pre-1970 uh, collection of, of these lichens that were on the list of climate indicators and then, then modeled what was, is their potential distributional uh, uh, range. And Pamelina Quercina, not surprisingly, was there before and there's no indication that occurrence in Central Europe has anything to do with climate change. It has to do with air pollution wiping it out in Central Europe and now it's coming back. The same is true for quite a number of species of lichens and 
I don't want to go through all the 30, but what I want to show you is that for a few, I think five or six of the species that were on this 30 species list, it actually works. So some of them only occurred after 1970, which indicates that they are actually might be indicators of climate change. But they could all that could also be uh, because of different reasons. They could also be good pioneer species that might be outcompeters in 25 years. But I know that you are most interested in, in this last chapter of my talk, like in chemistry. Um, so Lichen chemistry has played an important role in the taxonomy of lichens since Newlander first published a paper and used, it, used color tests with KOH to distinguish and describe different species around 1870. But it was really not uh, until after the Second World War that especially uh, Bill Culberson introduced uh, secondary metabolites as a character to distinguish different species. And this is just illustration from one of his uh, papers. This is from a seminal paper that he published in Science, where he, based on the secondary metabolites, he distinguished different species that look the same, but occurred in different areas uh, at the coast in Brittany and France. You have quite a number of different substances. Uh, most common are depsites, depsidones, and xanthones, but you have also terpenoids. Pulvinic acid derivatives are also uh, common, antraquinones. So you have a number of substances that are very common in plants and, and other fungi, but some that are really mostly uh, uh, concentrated on uh, in these lichenized fungi. And let's focus uh, on, on those a little bit here. This is, uh, for example, atranarine is an extremely common depsite that, um, uh, that occurs in, in, I would say, 30% of all lichens. It's a cortical substance. Uh, and it's a depsite that is basically two oscillinic acid uh, parts are, are coupled together. And if they are coupled with an e e ester and an ether bound, then they are called depsidones, like this panarine as an example of a, of a depsidone. So depsides and depsidones are the most common lichen substances, you could say. And they have a lot of different methylation and, and other long side chains and, and so on, a lot of changes here. And then xanthones are also very common. And here we have a number of different chlorinated xanthones at different positions. And in xanthones, you actually find that you often, when you have, for example, two, four, five, seven uh, tetra uh, chlorinated Norlich xanthone, you always find also two, four, five, seven, and four, five, seven, and blah, blah, blah. All the different um, chlorinations when you, when you uh, study uh, uh, lichen extract. Um, so you find quite a number of uh, these substances. And I think the record for lichen is 16 different sub substances, which I found in a Lecanora that, that I described from Australia that I then named after my colleague, uh, Jack Elix, who, who helped me a lot with the lichen chemistry, uh, Lecanora elixi. I thought that was uh, fitting. But in most lichens, you usually only have one, two, three, four, so a handful of substances. Um, but they are produced in large amounts. Sometimes up to 30% of dry weight is the, uh, the lichen substance. And the idea is that the fungus actually gets more carbon out of the photobiont than it needs. And it needs to get uh, rid of excess carbohydrate. Um, and these lichen substances have certainly a function, a lot of them chlorinated xanthones. Um, uh, they are used in tropical lichens against UV insulation, but they are also um, uh, against herbivores. 
Uh, ustnic acid, a substance we will talk about in a, in a minute, is a pigment that is a cortical pigment, obviously also kind of a sunscreen for the algal part. There's nothing really special about the lichen substance when you look at the biosynthesis. It just follows the normal pathways. So you have the shikimi acid uh, pathway where you have the pulvinic acid derivatives or here terpenoids. Uh, and most of the polyketides uh, through the acetate polymolonate pathway. So the individual substance might be unique and there are quite a lot of substances that are known um, that are only known from lichenized fungi, but the pathways of course, uh, not surprisingly are nothing uh, special, but you can use the presence of different substances of lichens in taxonomy, and this is just an example from one of our studies in the genus Lecanora, where we have a list and here different substances and uh, a number of these substances can be easily identified by either the presence of specific substances like this one or combination of their number of substances plus some uh, morphological characters that it's very easy and quick to identify these lichens just based on, on their secondary metabolites. And it's usually constant and a good taxonomic marker. In fact, a number of molecular studies show that these metabolites are often better predictor of phylogenetic relatedness or distinction of clades as different species than some morphological characters are. And this is not only when you look at the species level, also here at the entire family of Parmeliaceae, this largest family um, that exists in, in lichenized fungi, where we here have a number of different genera. And uh, we looked at the occurrence of usnic acid because I would say 40% of genera in the Parmeliaceae have usnic acid, 40% have atranorin and 20% have melanoid structures in their cortical layers. And the function of usnic acid and the melanins is probably the same. It's sunscreen or UV screen of some sort. Um, and they are also more occurring in exposed habitats in comparison to those with the colorless uh, atranorin. And our interest was to, to have an ancestor character reconstruction of uh, basically to understand uh, what was at the uh, origin, what was the first uh, Pamelyesi, what did it have most likely, and our analysis suggested that the first uh, Pamelyesi had usnic acid in it and that it got lost uh, uh, several times uh, in the clade of Pamelyesi. And then uh, we had a recent study by uh, Todd Witham in his PhD, where he looked at a classical example that Bill Kalberson used for his concept of sibling species in lichens. So there is the genus Pamotrema and a group of what he considered six different species in Texas uh, and, uh, and Florida, so in, this, in the uh, southeast of the US. And he had three species that were separated by their secondary metabolites, and they were all with apothecia, so sexual. And then he had three species that had the same chemistry as those, but that were asexual. And he distinguished those six species based on both basically sexual reproduction and secondary metabolites. And we looked at molecular data. What do molecular data suggest? So molecular data, just to go back, so round means asexual, a square means sexual. So you see here, sexual and asexual are not separate. So that doesn't seem to be a good predictor so the species can either be sexual or asexual. The chemistry, however, here in these colors, seems to be a very good predictor. So the different chemistries formed different clades. And 
Todd found an additional character because the cornelia lengths uh, in those different species was also different. So a morphological character, the cornelia lengths, and the chemical characters very well separate those similar species. The reproductive mode does not. And then we, we, we looked into, uh, starting with the genomic era, look at genes that are actually responsible for the production of the secondary metabolites. And especially we focused on the oscillinic uh, acid because as you remember, the depsides and depsidones that are so common, they're basically two oscillinic acids modified and put together through some ways, ester and ether or just ester bound. So we looked at those PKS genes that, that um, code for this 6-methylsalicylic uh, acid, which is uh, mostly only found in uh, lichenized fungi. And the PKS that codes for this actually clusters in, in a cluster of PKSs that are only known from bacteria. So then we also used, um, used answers to character reconstruction and that this reconstruction suggested that in fact, the PKS that codes for this specific PKS that produces most of the lichenized fungal uh, secondary metabolites uh, has been inherited through horizontal gene transfer from bacteria. Whether that's true or not, who knows, but, um, but it's a good, interesting hypothesis because um, these substances really are only known from either lichenized fungi or non-lichenized fungi that are closely related to lichenized fungi and are probably derived from lichenized ancestors. And then, of course, when you sequence entire genomes, you can get a lot of these PKS genes that you can fish out. And this is from a study where we looked at about 30 genomes of this family Pameliesi, remember this very spe species uh, family, where we found a number of these different groups of um, PKSs in the different genomes. And we wanted to look at specifically the genome that codes for usnic acid. And uh, colleagues who know more about uh, how to actually identify which gene codes for what uh, secondary metabolite, um, they found they actually identified the, the PKS that codes for usnic acid and was said, that's perfect. We look at it and uh, we found it in quite a number of our Pameliesi. And then we looked at the structure. So they were very similar. There was uh, the synteny of the different components of this PKS cluster that does very different reaction that then uh, uh, eventually produces these depsites and, and depsidones. And then we asked the question, okay, we have 40% of species um, in Pameliesi that have usnic acid and 60% that don't produce usnic acid. Is the gene cluster that produces usnic acid present in the genomes of lichens that do not produce usnic acid or does it get lost? Because you could just, it could be just switch off and on. That was my hypothesis, actually, what I expected. However, what we found is that all lichenized fungi that produce usnic acid, of course, had this gene cluster. I mean, otherwise, how, how would they be able to synthesize usnic acid? However, all genomes that we sequenced that do not produce usnic acid did not have the gene cluster. So the gene cluster apparently gets very quickly uh, lost. If you have a genus <clears throat> that <clears throat> doesn't produce usnic acid anymore, the cluster gets lost very quickly. And so it cannot be regained, which is consistent with our original hypothesis. Remember that where we looked at the family, where we said, well, usnic acid most likely was 
was present in the common ancestor of the entire family. Now, the next study that we have to do, of course, is to look at the atronarine gene cluster. And if we don't find it in, uh, in those that don't produce atronarine, I think we have a problem with our hypothesis. But we'll see. Uh, maybe we'll wait a little bit um, uh, before studying that. OK, so I want to uh, thank you for your attention. And before I, uh, I ask you whether you have any questions that I can answer, uh, I want to thank my collaborators and, of course, funding uh, for the studies that I, I showed that is mostly from NSF and the Spanish ministry. And uh, I want to especially thank my long-term colleague, Ana Crespo, uh, with whom I have maybe for 20 years uh, collaboration. Uh, and she is very successful in getting funding from the ministry. So I always have my fall extension of summer in Madrid uh, almost every year. Of course, not for the last couple of years with COVID. And I want to also um, um, put on my hat as VP of the museum. Uh, and want to say that uh, we at the Field Museum are really interested in, in uh, more collaboration with uh, all institutions in Chicago, and especially also um, UIC, and therefore it's a pleasure that uh, uh, Javier Reyes, the provost, will join the board of the museum. But I think uh, you should think about ways how you can use our collection, especially the herbarium, for teaching purposes, uh, but also uh, as a reservoir for examination of the collection, both the fungal and the, the algal collection. I know we have a large um, psilocybe collection because I always have to sign uh, for, for uh, the federal authorities that it's all locked up. Um, but um, also as um, uh, a way of deposit vouchers for studies. So think about it. And uh, since Javier has told me that he's really interested to increase collaborations, let's uh, think about uh, those as well. Thank you. Hey, how do we do we see any there's something on the chat? Okay. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Thank you. And I must admit that you have damaged my belief that lichens were some of the earliest producers of soil. <laughs> Well, you know why this, this hypothesis was formulated? It's because nowadays, ecologically, they are the first producers. So for example, when there is new land available, such as volcanic island suddenly comes out of the sea or a glacier retreats, lichens are among the first colonizers. And they eventually then produce soil for other organisms to, to conquer this land as well. But in evolutionary history, they have not uh, been the first to conquer land, at least not the clades of fungi that form lichens nowadays. That doesn't mean that clades that are long extinct might have uh, been among earlier colonizers, but at least what, what um, lichens now they are not old enough. Yeah. What, what led to extinction? Um, well, in historical time, we most of the time we honestly do not know. And there are some hypotheses, and most of the hypotheses focus on, on the KT boundary, so 66 million years ago, where the idea is, okay, dinosaurs were cold-blooded, so they, they 
got extinct. Uh, birds were warm-blooded and small. They could survive. Uh, so they are our dinosaurs now. Um, but we also have to keep in mind that there were different clades of dinosaurs that were warm-blooded. So the, the birds were not the only clade, but they're probably the, the size of the organisms helped. Um, our scientists, our paleont I'm not a paleontologist, so I, I really can only tell you what my colleagues tell me. And they work more on the other questions why did some species survive? And what those species usually have in common that survive is they are relatively small. They don't have, they don't need a lot of food because there's food scarcity in these uh, phases after the mass extinction. And they are usually generalists. So when you are very specialist, specialized in an ecological niche, then you're more likely to get extinct. Yeah. I had a question um, about sort of what appearance is like and why certain like they look like blocky or like coral or how they branch. What's the purpose for that? Well, the purpose in general is uh, increasing surface for photosynthesis of the photobiont. However, what and then there are other purposes. So, for example, when you uh, when you are on the Canary Islands um, uh, or at Mount Kenya, and at a specific altitude, you find a lot of lichens, but they are hanging and they are thin. Why do they do this? Because every day the cloud comes in the afternoon, and they basically, like a comb, take the the moisture out of the air, out of the fog, and so can do the photosynthesis. So there you have, you have a lot of species that are very finely thinned and they can so get the water. That would be one example. Another example is that you have powdery lichens often un, when you have a rock over, under the overhanging rock, you have a lot of powdery lichens that that can take where, where there's no cortex that that separates them from the outside, but where vapor water vapor can easily be um, taken in, so they can do photosynthesis and and be wet. Um, but actually, they are kind of hydrophobic, so you cannot really put water on them. Um, so there is again, this is kind of an adaptation to a specific habitat. Um, and, but then you also have to, I also have to say that you often have different growth forms growing next to each other. And they are, I don't know, both is possible, I guess. Um, but they are again also with the secondary metabolites. Some of them are really good phylogenetic markers and the substance antrachinones present in a family that is called Telochistesi, all species have it. <clears throat> so it's apparently they all have it, and it seems to be good as a sunscreen. In other groups, you have um, the most hydrophobic lichen substance that I know of, solarinic acid, um, occurs on the undersurface of a soil lichen in the Alps. Solorina. Uh, Crozia. And it occurs in the Alps in, in areas where the snow stays on for a long time. It's very wet. So there, obviously, the function of the secondary metabolite is to make it drier because it separates it, it makes it drier than the soil is because you can have oversaturation with water and this causes problem with the, with the gas exchange for the algal part. You, you mentioned first that the, the lichen can be reconstituted from <coughs> its two microorganisms. Yeah. Does this mean uh, there's a constant formation of new lichenoid species? 
because we have fungi and algae floating around. So is is there is this potentially going on, or is there mm. more to that? Well, in fact, if you are not an asexual species that basically reproduces and propagates through instant lichens and then just grows out and, and uh, on a new substrate, if a lichen reproduces sexually, the, the uh, fruiting was the epithecia are formed by the fungus and the spores are ejected. And there are very few, I have to say very few exceptions. Of, I think three genera of lichens, they have actually, actually algae in the upper part of the hymenium. And when the spores are ejected, the algae are ejected with them. But in most sexual species, the fungus is by itself. It, the spore germinates. And then the species has to find a new algal partner because it's not. And there are different strategies. One is to be a juvenile parasite. And there are quite a number of them. Another is to have an algal partner that is common in the habitat where the spore germinates. Otherwise, it couldn't survive. But we have no idea how long a fungus can survive in nature without finding the algal partner. We don't know. I mean, of course, you can cultivate them for a long time, but then they have their own agar and they can grow forever. But, um, but if they are like on a rock and they have to find another algal partner, no idea how, the, how long they can survive. Yeah. So lichens are uh, a female protein to organism. Yeah. So how come they are like, you know, categorized as single species? Um, follow up, uh, how, like, how do you sequence these to identify? Do you need two sets of primers, one for the um, fungus and one for the, the algae? Yeah. And, um, can you mix and match algae and fungi to make new lichen proteins? Okay, let's start with the primers. Yes, you need different primers that are fungal or algal or cyanobacterial specific uh, <clears throat> to basically make sure that you have it. not all primers that were published as fungus specific are really fungus specific, but that's another problem. Um, but you can also, um, what we now do, especially for the genomic studies, is that we isolate the partners, cultivate them, and then get the sequence. But then once you have a reference genome for a genus, like you have the microbion culture, you can use that to fish out, just you can basically sequence, genome sequence the entire lichen and fish the fungal sequences out of it. It's not not a problem. You need a reference genome, but the reference genome has to be a culture. Or when you do Sanger sequencing, you have to have a fungus specific or an algal specific prime. Yes. Um, then the question of mix and match, it is very difficult to resynthesize uh, a lichen. So I think there, there are maybe five or six colleagues who have done this. And when they successfully have done it, um, they make sure they publish about it. So um, I have never tried it, uh, maybe in, during my retirement, but um, I think it, it takes a lot of time and it's not that easy. Um, and we don't really know why it's so difficult. Uh, some people have the idea, you have a lot of other organisms in the lichen. So when you sequ uh, sequence um, a lichen, from the field genome sequence, you get a lot of bacteria and, and viruses and whatever, uh, and other fungi. So there are a lot of fungi in the lichen that are called endolichenic. Uh, then you have a lot of bacteria. Some of them are specific for specific um, uh, lichens or habitats. Do they play a role and would it, if you would know which bacteria or fungi to pick and add to the mix, it would be easy. 
probably, but um, I don't want to take the time to find out. Uh, <laughs> um, and and mix and match different things. Uh, usually, when you have even different species of the same genus of algae, they don't really. When you put them together, they don't really do a lot. So it's not. They seem to be uh, relatively specific. Um, and your first question. Um, in traditional taxonomy, lichens were classified and species described like they are a different group. But nowadays, what I try to do uh, also in my papers, I always talk about lichenized fungi. To be very clear, the species name refers to the fungus. That we use the morphology that is only expressed in a symbiotic state. Well, let's forget it uh, for the moment. But the, the name is really the name of for the fungus, a lichen name. And then the trebuxia that is in big inside the lichen is really then the trebuxia, blah, blah, blah. It's not the lichen name. And keep in mind that we have about 20,000 uh, lichenized fungal species, but maybe about three, 400 algal species that are associated with fungi. So a lot of these algal species actually occur in quite a number of different species. Yeah. Um, so Yeah, it, it is usually uh, relatively easy. So there are, of course, cases where you, you wander and it's really difficult to tell. Um, so for example, um, we always, when we have members night, we always, we put out um, some of these Usnia, the beard lichens, but also some Spanish moss uh, that is common in, in the South, in Georgia or Texas. And so Spanish moss is actually, uh, is a plant that is closer to re related to pineapple in the same family. Um, and then we talk about the similarities that Spanish moss is actually a plant and not a lichen. Um, but when you look at them closely, you can actually see that they look quite different from, from a lichen. From the distance, you might be confused. But in most cases, bryophytes are more greenish and are more like small stems and leafy things. And most of the lichens are either leafy structures or kind of different kinds of uh, of shrubs that look kind of different, not really like leaves in a way. Um, and when you have these bright colors with a lot of lichens, you hardly find this, definitely not in bryophytes, but you hardly find this in, in, in at least common fungi here in the area. So it's usually relatively easy to tell when you, when you get a feeling for, when you have seen a couple of them, then you get a feeling for how, how to look for them. But it happens even to me when I go uh, out in the field in the tropics somewhere that you collect something and then under the microscope you realize yeah, it's just a fungus, doesn't have algae. So there are some cases where it's really difficult, but these are more rare cases. Yeah? No, nope, no, they don't. They don't need uh, any substance. They just need a substrate, and they they just hold uh, tight to the substrate. That doesn't mean that sometimes some lichens actually take something out of the substrate. And what they take out of the substrate are usually some, for example, when you have lichens growing on heavy metal, there are some specific species that you find often on heavy metal. Are they just tolerant and they are poor competitors on other rock substances? I don't know, but they occur. But a number of them, actually, they look rusty. 
because they take whatever the iron or copper, whatever is in the substance, and they actually use some of the secondary metabolites, nostictic acid is a dapsidone that has been shown to form chelates uh, with those, um, with those uh, copper uh, ions. And so then they, they look actually um, uh, reddish or so, but that's typical for fungi. They really like to take on these uh, metals, which was the problem after the um, Chernobyl accident, we had a lot of radioactivity raining over Scandinavia. And then the lichens, the reindeer lichens that are actually really eaten by reindeers in winter, they accumulated a lot of the radioactive strontium and cesium. So they were more radioactive than the surrounding. They were eaten by the reindeers and all the reindeers had to be killed. And I had a colleague 100 years ago when I did my PhD who worked on this and he collected those lichens in Scandinavia, brought them into the lab to measure their radioactivity or whatever. And he, you couldn't just throw away those samples they had to be declared as radioactive waste because the radioactivity was so high, which is the reason why you shouldn't have eaten mushrooms after the accident. So they take on sometimes something, but they don't have to. They can grow on, it depends really on the species. Yeah. Why do you want to remove them? Well, they, well, if they grow in a car, then the car is probably there for 10, 15 years uh, and nobody took care of it. Not sure you want to remove them, but you could remove them just, uh, I mean, at the field museum, uh, they also get rid of the um, lichens. Unfortunately, I can't convince them that they are actually well, they are actually not that good for the for the rock. I have to admit they are weathering the rock, which is a problem. Also with Roman ruins, for example, but they use here this um, high power pressure thing to remove them. Not sure that is good for the rock either, but um, it's just my humble opinion. Yeah. how they start each species. So they reproduce either as powders where both algal and fungal partners are blown by the wind or by some insects or so. And then they just grow out again at a, on a, when they find their substrate or they form spores that can uh, be blown by the wind or, or other insects or um, also birds have been shown in their feathers to, to have uh, spores or other propagules of lichens that are distributed. And we have the idea that um, there are some lichens that are what we call bipolar and they are not crazy. They are, they are occurring in the Arctic and Antarctic circle. And the question is how much gene flow is between them? Um, and we are actually going uh, to Iceland in September to collect and hopefully find out more. Uh, when I look at the temperatures, I'm not sure why did I ex agree to go on this field trip. But um, the, if they have gene flow, then there must be some birds that fly this distance that that in their feathers transport those. Otherwise, I cannot imagine. I would expect that if there is not some bird or other vector making sure that there is gene exchange, that they will over time evolve into different species. Well, you decide who is going for it. I wanted to find out uh, how much of the
Oh, it's only the fungus. Yeah, the fungus produces the substance. The algae, the algae just provide the sugar alcohols for those. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, UV potentially damage DNA. And especially, for example, when you go in the tropics to a mangrove, the mangrove habitat, lichen, there are a lot of lichens growing on bark of mangrove, mangrove trees, and it's very exposed. So the sun shines on them the whole time. Uh, and when you collect those lichens, you will find that basically all of them produce chlorinated thansons. And those chlorinated thansons, when you cut, uh, have a section through those tali, you see they are on the uh, upper layer in the cortex of these lichens. So they really are UV protection to make sure that the mutation rate of these species is not too high. How high can you find lichens in altitude? I think the highest record from the Himalayas was from 7,000 meters, but I would have to check. But it was pretty high. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, I have seen some samples uh, from Antarctica that were also very close to the South Pole on a lunar tuck. So they, they be basically occur everywhere on terrestrial habitats from the highest mountains to um, even the, in the intertidal uh, at the seashore, the coast, some species occur uh, in the water, but not really, there are no really marine lichens in the way that they would be always submerged. There's, that doesn't exist. However, in river system, there are some lichens that occur in in small creeks in the mountain systems where they um, are always submerged. Interestingly there, it's a, a group of lichens that usually grows on rocks, but in exposed habitats. And they have this Trebuxia thing as a um, standard algae, but those that are submerged have a different genus. So there was obviously the switch to a different photo beyond allowed them to enter into this unusual habitat. Yeah. Uh, related to the last two questions, uh, do you have any comments or any insights about those lichens that were brought to space and then brought back to Earth? And oh yeah, Earth oh yeah. Yeah, uh, my friend Leo Sancho did this experiment. Um, and the funny thing was that he was devastated after the, uh, the rocket launch failed at the time, but fortunately they could find the, the samples again and then they could study and they were definitely exposed to radiation. <laughs> and um, the funny thing is, I mean, people also uh, uh, put lichens in liquid nitrogen and they survived in all this kind of funny thing. These are dry lichens. So when the lichen is dry, it's dormant, nothing happens. And you can torture it, uh, the lichens, nothing happens. When they are wet, it's a very different story. So the, the, the secret is really that they can be really dormant when they are dry. Um, and this is also the way they can survive in all these kind of different habitats. So um, Otto Ludwig Lange, who, who passed away a few years ago, uh, he did a lot of work in the Negev desert. And what he did is he, did, he was an ecophysiologist and he wanted to understand how can so many lichens survive in the Negev desert? So the answer is you just work for one hour a day. 
and then you just have siesta the rest. So they basically just, there's dew fall, and then just the first hour when the sun comes out, they can do photosynthesis, they are wet enough, and then when they dry out, they stay dormant, nothing happens, no physiological activity for the rest of the day. So, so they basically can, can live for a long time, but they're actually physiologically active only for a short period of time in these kind of habitats. And there are other lichens in deserts. Um, so even when you go to Australia, in the center of Australia, Ayers Rock, you will find lichens on Ayers Rock. Um, but they, they can stay dormant, and then they are just physiologically active for a period of time. When it's wet, then they stay dormant for a year or so. And it, uh, if it doesn't rain. Yeah. It really depends on the ecology. So lifespan of a lichen growing on a leaf in the tropics is up to two years. A lifespan of a lichen, a crustose lichen in continental Antarctica, five, six thousand years. So we, um, a colleague of mine, was lucky he went to um, an area where an expedition around 1905 did really nice photographs of lichens and they had markings on the rocks. And he went there 10 years ago or so, and he could find the markings and took photos of the same lichens that were photographed over hundred years ago. And when you, and then he showed the pictures on the left-hand side, 1905, right hand side 2010 or 15 or whenever he was there, you hardly see a difference. So then when you call, calculate the, the growth rate, it's at least 6,000 years old. So it's really, it really depends on the species. Is there a population Oh yeah. Oh yeah, so it, uh, there are a lot of people collecting lichens for curry in India in the Himalayas, which is actually an ecological problem that a number of species are oversampled. Then I have been in Japan and they have the speciality of uh, lichen restaurants that they have in the mountains where they have this Umbilicaya esculenta is the name. Uh, they serve it, I thought it tasted like styrofoam with soy sauce, but whatever. Um, and there, my colleagues in Japan said that they now get a lot of this umbilicaria imported from North Korea. So, and you can imagine that it's probably threatened there because they collect, or it's over collected. Um, it was used the, for dyeing of wool, especially Roxella, uh, uh, fruticose lichens in the Mediterranean and, and Canary Islands that was used for the purple color. And there you still can see some areas where there was over collecting of these lichens for dyeing of cloths. And then the Chinese cuisine has quite a number of different lichens, especially in Yunnan, where they use um, lichens for, for food. So yeah. Just fungus, just the fungus, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be, but there's also, however, in fact, for those that are used for dyeing, these are actually colorless substances, but there's a chemical reaction that makes them colorful. Yeah. It varies. Uh, in the standard of the majority of lichens, I would say 80% of the dry weight is the fungus, 20 the algal partner. But there are also some like hair-like lichens where they actually consist of algal uh, trichomes that are surrounded by fungal hyphae that the majority is formed by the, by the algae.
And you're welcome to go back into the garden or 